Good morning, people of God. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is the second Sunday of Advent. The uh, manger scene is before us as it was last week as a symbol and a reminder that we are waiting for Jesus to come, that we are in a season of looking and listening and being ready to meet Jesus when he comes to that place. In our lessons this morning, we uh, learned that the manger that is empty and waiting for Jesus is in Bethlehem, and we'll reflect on that in our worship and uh, in the sermon today. I want to say a word of welcome to those who are with us online this morning. Uh, May our time together be a blessing. Following our worship this morning, immediately, Uh, We will have a congregational meeting, our annual meeting, in which we will look at the budget proposed for the coming year and also take a look at filling our council uh, slots. Uh, So there will be uh, water available to make coffee and tea in the in-between time, but we will convene as close to 10.30 as possible this morning for that meeting. You will have seen that there are tables with stuff in the back of the Sunday School room. Uh, The silent auction items are up for uh, review and bid, as well as your offering envelopes available to be picked up for 2025. Monday and Tuesday of this coming week, we will be uh, hosting the families and the children of our preschool for what has become an annual preschool Christmas program. Uh, If you delight in seeing children um, come together and uh, dress up in Christmas costumes and tell a story, or if you delight in seeing your pastor challenged by all of that, (laughs) the the, uh, program will be 11 o'clock Monday morning as well as 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning. Um, It's a good opportunity, again, to be greeters, to provide hospitality to our preschool families who will be coming together for that event. We begin our worship this morning with the Advent call to worship. We pray and sing our longing for Jesus to come. Please stand as you're able and let us worship. People of God, one of the beautiful things about our Sunday morning worship is that we have the opportunity to pray both as individuals at a personal level as well as together as a community. Our time of the prayer of confession involves both that personal dimension and the communal dimension. We close our eyes, we bow our heads, we exchange private words with our creator, and we also pray out loud as a community which allows us to write our relationship with God and with one another. 
So as a community this morning, please join me in a call and response, prayer of confession. Join me in speaking the truth of our lives and in practicing grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are weary. For weary bodies that ache and cry out, we pray. Forgive us for pushing ourselves too hard. Remind us that we deserve Sabbath rest. For weary minds that feel overwhelmed and saturated with news, we pray. Forgive us for creating so many distractions. Remind us that in the quiet, we can hear you. For weary hearts that long to feel the joy of this season, we pray. Forgive us for being impatient with ourselves. Remind us that healing takes time and that joy and grief can coexist. For the weary edges of our faith that struggle to hold on to hope, forgive us. Remind us of Ruth and Naomi who chose to journey together. Remind us that your good news knows no bounds. Remind us that we are not alone. Family of faith, no matter how many times we wear ourselves thin, no matter how many times we lose ourselves to distractions, no matter how many times we ask ourselves, how can this be? God's love keeps showing up for us. So share the good news. We are loved. We are claimed. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. In a world that is lonely, we believe in a with us God, a God who walks with us in the valley, dances with us on the mountaintop, sings with us through the night, and rejoices in the morning. In a world of noise and confusion, Emmanuel, God with us, means I am not alone. We are not alone. In a world that is anxious, we will light candles against the gloom. In a world that is weary, we will sing songs of joy and truth. Here in this place, God is weaving us together. Christ be our light, shine in your church, gathered today. This morning, we light the candles of hope and peace. May these lights remind us of what could be. May these lights mark a new beginning. May peace flow like a river, and may it start with us. Arm in arm, hand in hand. May we begin anew. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, 
The words of this world whip around us like a mighty wind. We are caught up in news reports, in text messages, in emails and notifications. We are drowning in updates from the media, caught off guard by the constant hum of it all. But here on this Advent morning, we remember you too are speaking. Still the voices around us. Calm our minds and center our hearts so that we can hear your words above the noise. Speak to us as only you can. Amen. The first reading for the second Sunday of Advent is the first book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, in his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabad wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept out loud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. So she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Word of God 
word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, the first chapter. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Aminabab, and Aminabab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah the Hittite. All the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 more generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations, which came to pass in the days of Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Out of the four Gospels in the New Testament introducing us to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, only Matthew sees fit to open his story with a genealogy. Now, genealogy and the tracing of family roots is a popular pursuit these days not to mention a lucrative business for Ancestry.com and similar com companies. But still, in reading Matthew, it is tempting to skip over the genealogy because a long, dry list of names is not particularly compelling. For Matthew, however, God is in the details and his genealogy tells us a number of important things about Jesus and his place in God's plan. In beginning his story with a genealogy, Matthew is letting us know that Jesus' story is more than the story of one man. Matthew's list of names reminds us that although Jesus came into the world in a specific time and place, he was formed and shaped by the stories and the experiences of his ancestors, as we are all shaped and formed by those who have gone before us. In the genealogy, we see that Jesus' story is part of a bigger story, the story of God's people from generation to generation, 
the story of God at work in history, redeeming, restoring, reconciling a people. In the first line of his genealogy, Matthew identifies Jesus as the son of David and the son of Abraham. Matthew is tipping his hand here, letting us know that the ancient promises made first to Abraham and then later to David are about to be fulfilled in new and surprising ways. Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one in the line of King David of Israel, and he is the son promised of Abraham through whom all nations will be blessed. With this identity as Messiah in the line of David and Abraham, Jesus will be a shepherd king for all people and in him a new Israel will come to be. Matthew's genealogy uses a traditional patrilineal pattern of tracing a family's history through the father's line. Significantly though, Matthew breaks that pattern, father to father, to include four women with Mary, of whom Jesus was born. These women make for interesting branches on the family tree. There is Tamar, who was a Canaanite woman treated unjustly by her father-in-law, who resorts to desperate action. Rahab was also a Canaanite and a prostitute who protected Israelite spies in Jericho. Ruth the Moabite, we met her in our first reading. And Bathsheba, not named, but identified in the genealogy as the wife of Uriah the Hittite and subject of David's adulterous lust. In Matthew's day, including any woman in a genealogy would have been unusual. And including these particular women is even more of a surprise given their status as outsiders with questionable backgrounds. And yet, there they are, unlikely and unexpected participants in God's saving story. Today, we are lifting up the story of Ruth, who is the great-grandmother of King David. The book of Ruth is a short four-chapter narrative set in the days of the judges. You can go home and read it, it's that short. This morning we heard the entirety of chapter one and the last line bears repeating. This line is telling for those with ears to hear. It says, Naomi and Ruth came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. It turns out that significant things happen in the little town of Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem was in fact a common ordinary town, but it was a place of destination and hope for two women who had known grief and heartache. It was a destination 1,000 years later for Mary and Joseph and a son to be born there. In Hebrew, Bethlehem means house of bread. Bethlehem, house of bread. Ironically, Naomi and her husband leave because there is a famine in the land and there was not enough bread in Bethlehem. Naomi's story is a common and ancient story. In the face of want and hunger, she migrates with her family in search of a better, more secure life, leaving her home in Bethlehem for the foreign land of Moab. Now, in the geopolitical scheme of things, Moab is an interesting choice because Moab was one of Israel's most hated and despised enemies. But for Naomi, Moab was a place of sanctuary and a land of opportunity. Her sons grow up there. They marry there. Her family endures there until her life turns bitter with the reality of death. In Moab, Naomi becomes a childless widow, far, far from community and home. 
So Naomi decides to return to that house of bread, grieving and empty as she is, just as the barley harvest is about to begin. The passage we heard this morning includes Ruth's words of faithfulness and commitment to her mother-in-law. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. The thing is, Ruth didn't have to uproot herself and move to a foreign land with Naomi. No one would have expected her to tie her fate to that of her widowed mother-in-law and in a foreign land at that. For her part, Naomi didn't even want her daughters-in-law to suffer the constraints and poverty of widowhood with her. Go back, she kept saying. Start a new life in Moab where you are at home. But Ruth went with Naomi, sacrificing the familiar for the unknown. It's good to consider what may have motivated to Ruth to act as she did. What do you think? At the very least, Ruth was guided by a deep love and a regard for Naomi. At the very least, Ruth knew that we are made for relationship, for family, for community, and there are some things we cannot, should not do alone. So Ruth went with Naomi. And in this beautiful story, God worked through Ruth to provide companionship and kinship. Together, the two women went to Bethlehem, just as Joseph would one day go with Mary to Bethlehem, the house of bread. Ruth and Naomi, Mary and Joseph, God at work in humble lives to provide kinship, to provide daily bread, and to provide the very bread of life in Jesus wrapped up and laid in a feeding trough in Bethlehem for a hungry world. In God's story, things happen in Bethlehem. There, God provides the true bread from heaven to meet our deepest hungers and needs. Now, in the scheme of things in the Bible, the story of Ruth and Naomi is a little tale. It is personal and poignant and full of insights about daily life and culture in ancient Israel. After Ruth, the books of the Old Testament turn to grander stories, to the rise and fall of kings and kingdoms, and to the pronouncement of prophets. In the grand sweep of the Old Testament, Ruth's story is but a snippet, but her story beautifully reminds us of God's presence and God's purposes worked out in the nitty gritty details of everyday life where there is hunger and grief and uncertainty and fear. And Ruth shows us how redemption and blessing are possible through relationships marked by love and compassion, relationship marked by integrity and fidelity. Ruth shows us the grace of kinship and connection, the gift of family shaped by love and devotion more than blood ties or DNA. Ruth shows us that in God's family, we are better together and that no one need travel alone. Jesus enters this human story. Jesus enters the story of Ruth and Bethlehem and into your story and my story wherever we are. In Bethlehem, in that house of bread, the birth of Jesus says, God is with you to turn bitterness to hope, hunger to abundance, despair and death to birth and new life. The book of Ruth ends with Ruth's marriage, the birth of a son, and then chapter four concludes with a genealogy of all things, pointing us to the future, specifically to David of Bethlehem, who will become king. This genealogy in the book of Ruth is expanded by Matthew, both backwards and forwards, as he then introduces the storied lineage of Jesus. 
These genealogies remind us that Jesus came and lived among us, fully a part of the human family. In Jesus, a new family came to be, a family we might call the kingdom of God. In this kingdom, we are bound together as one. In relationship with Jesus, we are woven into God's story and into the lineage of God's people. In Jesus, we are better together and never alone. Throughout the story at hand today, in the book of Ruth, the woman who accompanied Naomi with such deep devotion and lo love is typically identified in the written text as Ruth the Moabite. Lest we forget, King David's great-grandmother was a foreigner, a Gentile from a people despised as the enemy. And at the same time, Ruth the Moabite is remembered in Israel as an exemplar of faith and fidelity, a woman who teaches the risks, the beauty, and the grace of accompanying one another as we go. Ruth's unlikely inclusion in the family of God is powerful testimony to the wideness of God's mercy, a mercy shown not just to some people, but to all people, even those we might be tempted to dismiss or judge as unworthy. Jesus was born into the lineage of women like Ruth and Tamar and Rahab, unlikely characters, which means he was born into a family marked by the wideness of God's mercy. Given this background, given this genealogy, it is little wonder that Jesus goes out of his way to heal, to feed, to bless all the unlikely characters he meets along his way. And it's little wonder that the Gospel of Matthew ends when Jesus sends his disciples to all nations, saying, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. In Jesus, the story that began in Bethlehem ripples forth with grace and blessing from town to city to nation, from generation to generation to us here today. Saints and sinners, insiders and outsiders, young and old, male and female, Jews and Gentiles, we have been grafted onto Jesus' family tree by love, and we are never alone. With Ruth and with Boaz, the man she marries in Bethlehem, we are all called to be mothers and fathers of the love and grace born among us in Bethlehem. With Ruth, we are all called to bless, to sustain, and to accompany others. The kingdom of God comes down to earth in such love and faithfulness. And we can know this because it's all right there in the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Good news and good challenge for all the people of God. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare for Emmanuel, God with us, let us pray for all people and places that long for God's presence, responding, Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Gracious God, in Jesus, born in Bethlehem, you show us the face of your compassion, and in him we live in the light of your love. Help us to hold fast to the promise that nothing can separate us from your love, and we are not alone. Give us the grace to love ourselves and one another as you love us. Inspire us by your spirit to be a community of welcome and belonging, a community overflowing with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear prayer. Surprising God, thank you for stories from your word that teach and challenge and inspire us in faith. As Naomi needed Ruth and Mary needed Joseph, we know that we cannot journey alone. So for all who walk alongside us, we give you thanks. And we remember those who feel left out or left behind, those who are lonely, estranged, lost in any way. We pray for those who doubt their worthiness and for all who are afraid because they've been hurt before. Shine the light of your love on these ones, O oh God, and remind us that with you we are not alone. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Ruling God, teach the nations your ways. Empower us to transform our swords into plowshares, our spears into pruning hooks, our weapons of death and destruction into the tools we need to cultivate peace and feed a hungry world. We pray for peace in the Middle East and Ukraine. We pray for daily bread and for the safe delivery of food aid in Gaza and Sudan. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Rescuing God, shine the light of your love on those we know who are standing in the need of prayer this day. Heal all who are suffering, those on our prayer list, and others we name aloud and in our hearts before you now. Gary, those seeking employment. Provide comfort and strength, nurture and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Gracious God, fill this congregation with your presence. We pray that the transforming power of your love will shine in us and through us. We ask that you would bless the preschool at Zion with wisdom and joy and bless our coming together this week as we share the story of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Savior of the nations, come. Receive these prayers and the pleas of our hearts. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a word and a sign of peace with one another.
Let us pray. God of our waiting and watching, we offer the gifts of our hearts and our lives to the service of all your people. Let them be a sign of your steadfast love and faithfulness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, the beginning and the end, our salvation and our hope, we praise you for creating a world of order and beauty. When we brought on chaos, cruelty, and despair, you sent the prophets to proclaim your justice and mercy. At this end of the ages, you, your son Jesus came to bring us your love and to heal all the suffering world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await his coming again in righteousness and peace. Send your spirit on us and on this bread and wine we share. Strengthen our faith, increase our hope, and bring to birth the justice and joy of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bread broken, wine poured out, the gifts of God freely given for the people of God. Come and feast at God's table for all is ready.
Please stand as you are able. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. With the nourishment of this meal, send us forth to proclaim good news to a weary world. By your tender mercy, let the light I break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and to guide our feet in the way of peace. Amen. God of endings and beginnings, God in the darkness and in the light, God our hope for the journey, bless and keep you now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the name of Christ, our new beginning, go in peace, prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.